It's like 10 different websites and the same filet mignon and, and then the same ribeye and then the same everything. And I just kind of like look at it and I was like, you know what? I mean, what am I going to bring? I mean, another ribeye, another filet mignon, that's, that's not going to work. Um, and then I, it, it just kind of like occurred to me, you know, that I have all these recipes that my mom was teaching, that my dad was teaching, that I've learned from people. I'm like this, I started looking it up and I couldn't find it. Like there's not a single blog about, um, about recipes, yeah. world recipes for the grill. And I thought, you know, maybe there is a reason why there's not a single blog about it. Maybe people don't want that. But curiously, people started visiting the blog and started signing up for the newsletter and all that. And that was kind of like boosting, you know, me a little bit. And, and now this is what I'm doing. Um, and, and that was kind of like my, hey, I look forward to my, my next recipe. And, uh, and it was terrible. I was bad at it. <laughs> I always thought that I, I just killed there. And then to me, grilling was like, just throw some meat on the grill. And when it becomes brown enough, you just take it out. So. <laughs> In 2009, I left, um, I left, I left Los Angeles. I had my two suitcases. My business was gone. I was in debt. I was divorced <laughs> and I ended up back to square one. And I, it was a big question mark of like, where am I going now? <laughs> Could you like break down that story a little bit more? Like, how do you get to start the business? What are some of the things went, that went wrong? And hindsight is 20 to 20. You can't see everything in hindsight. You can't tell exactly what happened. What could you have done differently? Or you think you could have done differently that would have changed the outcome of that business, if anything, really? Every single step that I took at that time was just a new obstacle. That was like stepping into a trap at every step of the way. And I could not help already at that time, even though I was like not really term spiritual spirituality of where I am right now I was just thinking you know this this is this kind of like sounds like someone above is telling me that this is not meant to happen <laughs> it's good to have ambition it's good to have a dream um, something to pursue and, and never give up but at the same time it's also important to make peace with who you are and what God, God gives you and and to not envy what you don't have but kind of like embrace and celebrate what you have. We all have something. So we're okay. here. Good, oh, good, yeah. Thank you for having me on your show. Where are you where are you calling from? I am calling from Jamaica. Ooh, nice. <laughs> have you tried Jamaican food before? I have, uh, yes. Uh, I even tried recently uh, Jamaican Jamaican pe pepper steak. That was my pepper first uh, mm -hmm. first attempt. I I went. I visited Jamaica a long time ago, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I I can't remember what we had on <laughs> that trip. <laughs> yeah. It's a really nice place when it comes on to food. I oh, was um, yeah. a short while ago. I was on YouTube and they uh -huh. were interviewing in America. They were interviewing an Indian girl, uh -huh. and they asked her. What was the biggest um, culture shock for her when she moved from India to America to study? Uh -huh. And she said that it was the food, because apparently the food in America for her is a little bit bland and she can't have it every day. She said she can tolerate it, but she can't have it every day. So now I'm wondering, how spicy are they cooking food in India? And as you would get it, <laughs> here we are. Who better to ask about that? <laughs> that one, Thierry Oliver, correct? Yeah, that's correct, Thierry. Like Thierry Henry. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. I am here today with one Thierry Oliver. Thierry, how are you today? I'm good, I'm good. Uh... You're looking good. You seem rather excited and full of energy, vibrant. So nah, I'm excited. It's a beautiful day here, sunny day. So and I'm on vacation. So one of the perks of being a teacher. <laughs> oh yeah, where are you located? I'm in Orange County. That is in America, right? It's yeah, California. Yeah. Oh, California, Orange County. Interesting. You've been there a long time, or just for vacation? Mm, no, we've, we've been. Um, I moved to the U.S. to study in 2001, but I've been like back and forth. And we oh. moved permanently to Orange County in uh, 2013 when my daughter was born. Oh, 
That's nice. Yeah. So you've been there for quite some time and you're familiar with the place and everything like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. I, um, this is not going to be a normal boardroom podcast episode because normally we have the business heads come in. They talk business and entrepreneurship. But then you reached out and you said, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. And I thought, you know what? Let's go for it. Let's have an interesting guest on and let's see where the story takes us. So oh, well. uh, I'd be happy to that. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. And if you want, I don't mind talking about the business side of things. I had a, I opened a wine store in uh, Pacific Palisade in Los Angeles area uh, a little while ago. So I can definitely talk about it and how I went from there to being a teacher to eventually opening up uh, uh, Gruel Culture and, and how I'm using the AI mostly, <laughs> which has been like my number one assistant. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. We can get there. We have time. <laughs> so here's the thing. We're going to play out a scenario, very popular Mm -hmm. scenario. It's not popular, but it's one that we've always played out here. Before I can um, introduce you to the scenario, where is your favorite city? My favorite? Oh, my goodness. Uh, You know what? It's a hard one. I would say uh, Paris has a place in my heart because, um, well, first, I always went back there. Every time, like, of my trip, whatever, everything always brought me back to Paris. Uh, So Mm. always have, like, some sort of, like, a sentimental attachment to Paris, but uh, it's also where, uh, when I met my wife, we had, uh, have, uh, one of the, probably one of the best time of our lives. So we, uh, she was here and I was back then in Morocco, I was working textile and I was doing all the trade shows and we would always meet in Paris. We just like go around to the restaurants and hang out, visit. <laughs> so, so there, and the food is great. So, yeah, but I have to I say know. that everywhere I've been, you know, each town has a, has a little special touch, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Paris um, sounds wonderful. Sounds romantic. I um, <laughs> I would love to visit one day. So let us let us. Here's a scenario. Let us mm-hmm. say that you and I are in Paris, having a good time, having a chat. We might be in front of um the Eiffel Tower. We don't know. We're having a good time. And while we're there, I see one of my friends approaching, and I say, you know what? I'm going to introduce my friend to theory. And I say to my friend, friend, this is theory. Theory, this is friend. When I introduce my friend to you, who exactly is friend meeting when he meets theory at this time? Ah, oh, I think pretty much like like everyone, uh, several people. I'd say that no more in person they're meeting as uh, hopefully a friendly guy, um, and uh, but it's also a, a husband and a father. I guess that's my number one job in life. I have two okay. wonderful little babies. I was probably spend some time talking about them. <laughs> and uh, I guess the second person is probably the teacher. I've been in special education here in California since 2013. So it's been a little while now. And uh, I really love what I do. I love working with my little champions, as I like to call them. And uh, I guess the last person is the, is the barbecue fam. And, and, and that's the grill, grill spirit side of thing. Grill culture, sorry. <laughs> Grill culture. And we'll have to talk about grill culture just a bit mm-hmm. because there can't be there can't be good food on offer and we pass upon that. I am quite interested in your story. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I'm interested is because you're living on the adventure side. All right. Mm-hmm. So I myself, not so much on the adventure side. I would love an adventure every now and again. But when I get an adventure, it's usually in the form of some major business problem or fire that I have to put out. <laughs> you on the other side, you've lived life rather expressively. You have chased your dreams. You have, I wouldn't say indulged in your passions, but you spent a fair bit getting a very uh-huh. good handle, not on just your passions, but using them to, as you said, you have a wine business, start a business. You are exceptional in that you're a husband and a father. That's something I tip my hat to if I had one and <laughs> I commend you. So you've done so many things in your life today and it's quite amazing. If you had to list the top three most impactful moments of your life so far, which three events would you list as the most impactful and why? Um, the most impactful was definitely, um, you know, when my kids were born, uh, that was like, 
not only an amazing blessing in life, but that was also a life-changing experience. I mean, we went from, my wife and I were really um, travelers and we'd spend a lot of time in restaurant. Back then I was like, really every weekend we'd come and we'd be like, okay, well, what's next on our calendar? So, uh, and we had to go from there to being at home and kind of like try to build a stable home for our kids um, mm-hmm. and, and make sure that, you know, we don't, we, we give them like that routine that kids need to have. But the next most impactful was definitely meeting my wife. Uh, I, I am divorced. I, I was in a relationship before and I is probably like a lot of people out there spent a lot of time looking for the soulmate. And, uh, when I met her, it was, um, uh, I, it was the second blessing in my life. It, it completely changed everything. I went from, you know, being alone, uh, cruising the world and doing whatever I want to just, you know, having someone to do it with, which made everything more fun. And, and I guess the last one was definitely, um, it was faith. Uh, it was finding God and, uh, it's, it was, I mean, I was always, I I'm born, I'm, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I was baptized. My parents baptized me and took me, uh, um, a while to really open up to kind of like carving that, that time and that space, you know, to, uh, be, uh, more faithful and, you know, more into the religion, but that has changed my life in probably in the best and, and, uh, and there, so there would be probably the three most important moment, <laughs> impactful moment. The thing about it, you know. And I find it's quite interesting. Whenever, and I'm not a, I'm not a dad, right? I'm not a uh-huh. dad and I'm not married. But based on what I've, ex, um, it's not experience. It's like I've seen it happen over and over and I've heard it so many times. When your child is born, it's like a new part of you develops, right? And yeah. when you meet your wife and you meet her at the altar on that blessed and faithful day, as I would put it, a new part of you develops. And mm-hmm. when you meet God, because I'm also a Christian, not a Catholic, but I'm a Christian. When you meet God, you can't help but change the direction of your life. The reason why I yeah. mention all this is because you have experienced all three. And as you said, these are the three most impactful moments. If you had to list three in no specific order, mind you, moments of your life. I'm quite interested, though. Let's say that we're speaking to a young theory, 12 years mm-hmm. old. Growing up, where did you grow up, actually? Because I know you've been around the place quite a lot. You've traveled quite a lot, and you've indulged in quite some delectable delights. So we're going to get there. <laughs> but where did you grow up? I was born in, uh, in, in Africa. I grew up in Africa. So I was born in um, Abidjan, uh, Ivory Coast. And uh, when I was uh, about 10, 11, uh, there was a okay. civil war that started, and we had to, we had to flee the country. And uh, we went to Morocco where my dad opened up a business in textile industry. So between uh, 79 and I'd say roughly 99, I was full time in Africa. And then around uh, 2000, I left um, and, and I started studying a little bit here, a little bit there. And I came back to Morocco, spent some time, went back, left, opened my business here, came back again there. <laughs> I've been all around the place at this point in time. All right. That sounds good because that means that you've had the opportunity to experience opportunity to experience life from different perspectives, which is invaluable. Mm-hmm. When you were so let's say that you're in Morocco, twelve uh-huh. years old, after the civil war breaks out in Ivory Coast and you've left. Is this something, the life you're living now, teacher, father, husband, food connoisseur, traveling the world, is this mm-hmm. something that you wanted growing up? Or oh yeah, just yeah. Happen upon it, or you did. It's, it's actually that since since Ivory Coast started, my my mom was actually the the one who got that that American dream uh, mm-hmm. idea into my mind. And uh, I remember we were um, we were sitting in our living room in over there, and she would she would listen to Elvis Presley, and and she was a big fan of Michael Jackson, and she was like uh, talking to me and telling me. <laughs> yeah, so especially, you know, it's a very different <laughs> gender mm-hmm. genre. And she would be telling, she would tell me about America, about America where, you know what, if, if you go there one day, you know, you can make all of your dream come true. All you got to do is just believe in yourself and, and mm-hmm. go there. My dad was always like, he liked, he loved America, but uh, I, I think he was living his, his dream was to be in Africa. He always wanted to, uh, 
to go and live in in yeah in Central Africa. So that was his his I guess his American dream. <laughs> and uh, and there, so so yeah, I would say, hey, dude, I I did it. Look, look we're here. <laughs> yeah, you did. And the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because you're a teacher, so you would have seen students overcome much trials and difficulties. You would have seen them far surpass their potential and what you would have expected of them. Oh yeah, and. Yeah you know what it takes to be successful. I mean, you have lived a life. So what are, in your own words, what are three of the most important things that we have to do to ensure that we're not just here and then we're gone? Instead, while we're here, we have a good time and we achieve those things that we set out to achieve. You know, you don't want to live a life of disappointment. So what are those three things you would point to and say, all right, when you do these three things, they're going to put you in as best a position as possible. Or maybe you can say, do these two things and definitely don't do this one thing mm-hmm. that will help us to be more successful. Well, not more successful, but give us a higher chance of being successful. Yeah. I, you know, I, I feel that we, um, it, it, this is where the faith also kind of like come into play. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a simple and a difficult question to answer. It depends where you are in your life. To me, I feel like um, you, you got to make peace with yourself. Uh, you know, it's it's very easy to look at a celebrity and say, oh, my gosh, like, I, I would love to have that. Like, I, I want a yacht. I want a yacht. I'm, I want to travel the world and, you know, mm-hmm. make YouTube videos and get like millions of followers and whatever. But it's not given to everyone to reach that height. Yes. So I think sometimes like it's good to have ambition. It's good to have a dream, uh, something to pursue and, and never give up. But at the same time, it's also important to make peace with who you are and what God, God gives you and, and to not envy what you don't have, but kind of like embrace and celebrate what you have. We all have something. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying that because um, I've been trying to teach my kids, you know, sometime we've been spoiling them. They have grandmas and grandpas that are very <laughs> generous with them. <laughs> so uh, my wife and I did not grow up like that. Uh, and, uh, and we were always telling them, like, hey, you, you know what? You got you to gotta be happy about what you have. Like, this is, this is a lot, you know? And I always give the example of um, when I was in Ivory Coast, um, I, would, I was living outside of town in Yopugo, and that was um, kind of like an industrial area. And in the, in the street where I was living, like, it was in a, kind of like some sort of a little village. And there, there were these kids that I was playing with. And, like, half of them, they, they hardly had any clothes on. Um, and... And I was telling them, like, I never saw e- either one of them without a smile on their face. So it's, I was like, this is not about, you know, all that material stuff you have, but about like, mm-hmm. like your peace in your, within your heart. So I'd say like the one thing that I would give advice to everyone, just embrace life as it is and, and find that peace within. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, something that you do through faith by opening up your heart to God or by... I don't know, embracing a career that you like by finding your soulmate or, or whatever it is, just find that peace and be happy with every day. And then the doors are just going to open up on their own. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's all about faith and then everything follows after that. And you know, interesting thing about faith though, and <laughs> this is going to sound counterintuitive. When you, when you put it in the hands of faith, and by faith we mean God and so on, mm-hmm. it becomes less about what you want more about what he wants and more about you being obedient to his will. So you might find that you want to, let's say that you want to be a race car driver, Formula One. You're in over your head. You borrowed your dad's car once or twice. You (laughs) overtook a few cars. That sounds like trouble. (laughs) Right? And you're in over your head. You want to be a race car driver. You're going to pray about it. And faith faith is going to say to you, you know what? Mm -mm. Leave the race cars alone. I want you in the emergency room. I want you working with patients who have met uh-huh. in car accidents. And you could at some point in your life be like, wow, this could have been me if I would continue on the journey. And that's where happiness comes in. Because now you have the faith that the path that you're on, provided that you have been obedient and you've been subservient to God's will, is a path that you best need to be on. And as you know, the brain works. If you're going to focus on being happy, even if the situations, like the children in Africa, like you said, barely have any clothes on, never frowning, never upset, always smiling, always happy and playing, you're going to be happy most of the time. And 
I can see it on your face. You've been so bright and cheerful this entire time. So now I'm going <laughs> to put it out there. And this is a question that's going to stoke you. You're going to be like, wow, I didn't expect this. <laughs> You're so happy. You're so cheerful. <laughs> Tragedy brings out the best in us. Uh-huh. Just one. Yeah. One tragic experience that helped to shape your view on life and help you to have a certain appreciation, perhaps for life, perhaps for people, mm-hmm. perhaps for the blessings that you have. What would that what, what would that one event be that would have shaped you into who you are today? I, I don't know if I you know, I, I kind of like get that that idea that you were talking about. It's for me, it wasn't really a tragedy what happened. It was more like a, it was like all of my dream and my world falling apart when I close my business at uh, my wine style, this is my wine venture. Um, and, and I feel like this is, this is what kind of like shaped me into like reassessing who I am. And, and yeah. I, you know, I never thought I was going to be a teacher. I was terrible at school. <laughs> I, uh, I, my, my thoughts was like, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm my, in my mind, things were simple. If I don't become the president of France, um, I was simply going to become a millionaire <laughs> here in America. It was not going to be hard. <laughs> I was going to be married to top, like a supermodel, probably top model is not enough. Um, and I was, everything that I was going to touch would turn into gold. People would just line up outside. <laughs> So that was yeah. the college me, <laughs> if you had yeah. talked to me at that time. And then here I am, and I'm arriving in America, and I had to open that business in order to get my green card. And um, and we put we poured a lot of money into it at that time, and and it was not working. Like no matter like every single step that I took at that time was just a new obstacle. That was like stepping into a trap at every step of the way. And I could not help already at that time, even though I was like not really uh, in terms of spiritual spirituality where I am right now. I was just thinking, you know, this this is this kind of like sounds like someone above is telling me that this is not meant to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and and then I met uh, who was my ex-wife, and I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe it's time to settle down. I need to kind of like look into it. From the start, same thing. We were not a good match, but. Uh, you're young and you just wonder like what exactly is a good match you know it's it's just mm-hmm. as good as any other so i got into that and and then 2000 in 2009 i left um i left i left los angeles i had my two suitcase my business was gone mm-hmm. i was in debt i was divorced <laughs> and i ended up back to square one and i it was a big question mark of like where am I going now? <laughs> like, okay, clearly this is not my destiny. So, and this is where I just sat. And I remember being in Paris, I sat down in the church and, and I just started talking to God every single day <laughs> and, uh, and everything changed. I was like, you know, I'm just going to leave it in your hand. And this is what I, what I wanted, but maybe not mm-hmm. what I needed. Um, I was like, you know, at this point I've done my best and this is like, it's going to take me where it takes me. And today, I mean, I look back and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I, there was another plan for me. It's not really what I thought it was going to be. I did not become president, but now I, I, I wouldn't want to be a president. <laughs> Things are very has different. Lot of stress, so. doesn't he? And responsibilities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think this is what I'm saying. Like, you know, sometimes it's in, in faith. It's just sometimes it's kind of like just... Embrace every day and what every day has to give you. Take the best of thing, and it's there is only so much we can do to take our dreams where we want them to be. <laughs> yeah, and if we can come to that point, that realization and acceptance that it's not us alone, then all the circumstances they become, as a matter of fact, they don't become the reason or the deciding factor of anything. I am thoroughly enthused by your story because you said that at the time you were trying everything and it would be like a trap to a trap to a trap no matter where you went or what you did it always led to failure and mind you you were doing this because you wanted your green card having studied in america for quite some time so this was kind of like a home you were building you were doing this sort of necessity to have a place to live and everything it didn't work out could you like break down that story a little bit more like how do you get to start the business what are some of the things went, that went wrong? And hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, you can't see everything in hindsight. You can't tell exactly what happened. 
what could you have done differently? Or you think you could have done differently that would have changed the outcome of that business, if anything, really? I, I think I was I was a little bit of a brat uh, back then. Um, brat? And brat? A little bit of a brat, yeah. <laughs> and completely out of phase with reality. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, th- I was very fortunate, honestly, growing up. My parents always kept me into that beautiful little bubble where everything in my life was just simple and beautiful. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, um, and then I, 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 I had to like go and fly on my own. And I think I was really not prepared to get there. And I think I did what I did for the wrong reasons. Um, mm-hmm. It's, um, it's, it wasn't that I wasn't hardworking. I actually worked really hard, but I, my number one goal was really to stay in America. I really liked it. I, I, as soon as I got here, I remember getting out of the LAX airport and I looked around. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is even better than the movies we used to watch. Oh, really? <laughs> and, that awesome? Oh, that was like, I, I think I just connected. I mean, I've seen a lot of places in the world um, okay. and and I, I fell in love with a lot of them, you know, but there is not like a single one where I really felt like, oh my gosh, I want to leave here. Uh, it's like, it's almost like the, the, the color of the sky. Everything was beautiful. I felt like I was just living in my dream. And, um, I, I just decided that whatever I was going to do was going to bring me here, but I wanted, I wanted, I don't, I didn't want to compromise on, um, certain values and principles. Yes. Yeah. Like when I came here, like, I remember I, I went surfing and I was in the water. I was sitting there. I met a guy and he was like, um, you know what? Just get married. Like, just get married. You'll find someone and you'll get your green card. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to do that. Like, this is too much of like on of an important thing to kind of like do that. So I had to figure out how I was going to stay. And that was through business. I had to create a business and invest half a million dollar here. Uh, so there was like, like a way of doing it. You didn't have to like put a lump sum of like a million dollars. Obviously I didn't have it. Um, That's where my parents kind of like were able to help me. I was fortunate enough to have, you know, they had their business and they were doing fine. So we could kind of like uh, invest a little bit, like a more reasonable amount here and, and make a plan of like investment over the long run. And it didn't work out the way I wanted. I still managed to get my green card through that, but at the same time it was, um, it was my main goal. And I remember when I was here, uh, it was like, hey, do you strategic planning? So I I just took out my uh, manual from UCLA and I was like, okay, well, let's let's just put together a, a business, like a strategic plan. So there there I have like the next 10 years of my, my life planned up in half an afternoon uh, in my bedroom. And, uh, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to follow the steps. Mm-hmm. But then... I could not find a location. So I got a franchise because I was like, okay, well, you know what? Wine business, that was the trend. And, you know, I'm French. So uh, wine wine business is part of my life since I'm 16 years old. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to get into that. That's probably like one of the things that I know the best. Um, but then he was like, hey, I got to find a location. Like time is passing by and I'm like wasting money here, uh, looking for things. And it was, it was a nightmare. Like it took like after three or four months, there's still no location. And, uh, and I went to like our, uh, our agent and I was like, okay, you know what? We, I, I can't just like keep on like renting things in Los Angeles and just wait until something happens. Herman, like, and he was like, you know what? I'm not finding anything. So I settled down for a location that was in Pacific Palisade. Um, it was like off like Sunset Boulevard and just toward the end. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? That's as good as any, I'll make it. And it was like 6,000 bucks a month. And I was like, that was the... My dad was like, dude, I, are you going to make $6,000 worth of wine? And, and I was like, well, I mean, I'm probably not going to sell that many bottles, but I'm going to, that location had some space. So I'm going to do some event in it. So then I had to get like a, a permit for that. So, and the permit took a long time. And a year and a half later, I finally was able to open uh, that business it took me a year and a half to get everything ready. By that time, half my budget was gone. And I was also not lucky because there was 2008 and it was when the, the crisis hit. The crisis uh, was about to start with a housing yes. crash. And, and then people wow. were like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to waste time on buying wine. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to keep my money for more, more important things. So, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that was, that was it. Like a combination of like, you know, poor choice. I mean, I'm sure if I, if I had, gotten a location that was a lot more reasonable, affordable. And I was not like living in 
uh, Marina del Rey by the ocean, I probably uh. would have more money <laughs> to invest in that business. So a lot of, you know, poor decision because I really wanted to stay where I was. So, so now with Grail Culture, I definitely haven't made the same mistakes and things are working out. <laughs> Because that's what I'm coming to. Because <laughs> you broke it down so simply and you said, all right, so this is a condition that existed at the time. This is where I started. What was the name of the wine business? If you if you can share the name. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's uh, It was a franchise. Uh, back then, they, um, there was a lady here in um, Manhattan Beach that opened a, a business that was called Wine Style. Uh, I, no, she had a different name. But then she turned it into a, a franchise and they called the franchise Wine Styles. And it was a great franchise. The concept was was awesome. It, it was like mm-hmm. wines that are between uh, fifteen twenty five dollars, roughly, or or maybe even less. Um, it was affordable wine that were like unique little wineries. Mm-hmm. So that was that was great. I had tasting every day at breakfast. It was ter- it was great and terrible at the same yeah. time <laughs> because it got used to it, huh? But, oh yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. You've learned your lesson. You've summarized it wonderfully as well. And now we have grill culture. Grill culture is doing something quite amazing. Grill culture, for you guys who aren't familiar, it's cuisine, and correct me if I'm wrong, cuisine Mm -hmm. from the world, meat, only meat, but what you do is you experience different cultures, how they prepare different meats, how they prepare different meals. You add your twist to it, and then you make that part of your offering and what you do, correct? Yes, yes, pretty much, yeah. All right, now, so this is where we start to cook. Tell us about grill culture. How did you get started? Why did grill culture even (laughs) pop into your mind? Like, how did that even happen? And what has been your experience so far? Just give us an idea of grill culture. And of Mm -hmm. course, if you can tell us, like, some of your offerings, where you are, if you have a website we can check out, if mm-hmm. anyone from the California area, the LA area listening would like to get in touch or they would like to order how they can go about that, just talk to us about grill culture for a few minutes. Wet our appetites, as they would put it. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So so grill culture was like really an accident. I mean, it's not a, an accident. It was not planned. Uh, it was like one of these like accidental pregnancies. Um, <laughs> But it was good. It was a blessing. Just like, uh, yeah. you know. A happy coincidence. Exactly. So I, um, after Wine Style, I kind of like never, I always had that entrepreneurial mindset exactly. where I was like, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to create something. I'd like, I'd like to build a business. And uh, it doesn't have to be a international corporation, like a local, like little business, something. I always saw that as like a, some sort of a creative outlet uh, in some ways. So um, I miss that kind of like entrepreneurial um, project. And for like years since, uh, since my wife and I moved here, I was like, oh, well, what can I do? What could I do? Like something. But then, you know, we never really wanted to take the risk that we took, you know, with Wine Style again and put pour in a lot of money. And, uh, and during the pandemic, I, I always loved cook, cooking. So since I came back here in 2013, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to cook. That's going to be my... My creative yeah, outlet is I, I could not do anything else with my two kids. I mean, when Evan was born, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is, son, there is right? no, that's my son. Yeah. My, my daughter, Zoe was a uh, 2013, my son, 2016. And okay. I, he was like my full time there. Like I, and every time I, I like that, you know, I like spending time with them always. That was, uh, it was also another reason why I became a teacher because I wanted to see them grow up. I want to be, be with them. So, so I, I, there was just no more room, no more room for surfing, no more room for anything. Even my wife and I was like full time, like taking care of our kids. So, um, so cooking became really the only creative outlet that I had, the only hobby, the only everything. So every weekend I would come, I would just like sit outside and just grill. Like I would cook something, I would try something new. Um, and, and that was kind of like my, Hey, I look forward to my, my next recipe. And, uh, and it was terrible. I was bad at it. <laughs> I always yeah. thought that I had a skill there. And then to me, grilling was like, just throw some meat on the grill. And when it becomes brown enough, you just take it out. So. <laughs> Salt and so, pepper, that's it. Exactly. No, 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 there. Some more, right? <laughs> so, so, and around that time, and that's how I got mm-hmm. into more cooking. One of my friends from college invited me over and we went to visit him. And he started grilling something. He gave us a, 
a filet mignon and it was delicious. It was incredible, you know, like one of these like so tender melt in your mouth kind of thing. There was like not a drop of blood that was like gushing out of the thing. I was like, dude, how did you do it? And he took me to his grill and then, and there was that machine that's out there. I'm like, this is not a grill. This is like, a, it's a car or something. <laughs> and it was like, um, no, I mean, I, I have my probes here and this is how I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And, and I, I came back home and I told my wife, I was like, you know what? I am not barbecuing. I thought it was barbecuing, but I'm not more bar. I'm, I'm doing something terrible. It's a sin there. <laughs> yeah. So, so I started digging into it and, and I was like, okay, I'm going to invest into, into barbecuing. And I tried different things and to the point where when the pandemic started in 2000. 19 ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were stuck at home and there was no restaurant. We couldn't yeah. travel. We couldn't go out. We couldn't do anything. And I was like, sure. you know what? That's all I have left now. <laughs> okay. it's, uh, and my wife also got into cooking. So it was like a bonding thing. Like she was making all those like side dishes and all that. And I would make, I would be making the main, uh, uh, the entree, the main piece of meat, whatever. And, um, and I loved it. And, um, and then at the end of the pandemic, when we started inviting people over, people were like, oh my gosh, it's so good. It's so good. You, you should, you should post something. Like what, what is that recipe? I've never tried before. And you should just kind of like send me the recipe. So I started sending people recipes. I started posting about it. And people were like, oh, that's great. You should have your blog. And right at that time, I was reading an article where there was that little girl who was, uh, I mean, it was not a little girl, but she was a college girl or something. And she was writing about blogging. And, um, and she was saying it's not easy, but she was saying it's like, if you can make it, this is, this is a great um, mm -hmm. kind of like business opportunity. So I was like, well, you know, might as well. I keep the, I'm sharing that anyways. So I might as well just, might as well. just log at the same here. time and there. Yeah, <laughs> and it was right. so hard. It was so hard, man. It took me like one day. The first post that I, I wrote took me a whole day to write one post. <laughs> yeah, because it's the I first no, time, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. And I was there and my wife was like, she's an English teacher. And she was like, you know what? Your, your English is terrible, man. No one's oh, going to read that. <laughs> nobody wants to hear that. Nobody <laughs> trying to get started. But I, I, you know, I stayed there and she was like, at, at first she was like, kind of like revising my work and all that. And yeah. I was like, oh man, this is like, I'm not going to make it. I got to find another like that bummed way. Out yeah, that's that's not going to work. If, if I have to spend full day every time I write a post, that's not going to work. And, and that's, that's why I, I started digging. For you at a time either because you wanted to express yourself in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to, I definitely didn't want to spend like, I don't know how long. And then my wife come after and tell me like, hey, you know what? From an English teacher perspective, this is horrible. So uh, I was like, that was not going to work. So I kind of like started that time kind of like thinking like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to look at what people are doing. And, and I noticed at that time, people, there, it's always the same recipe. It's like 10 different websites and the same filet mignon and, and then the same ribeye and then the same everything. And I just kind of like look at it and I was like, you know what? I mean, what am I going to bring? I mean, another ribeye, another filet mignon. That's, that's not going to work. Um, and then I, it, it just kind of like occurred to me, you know, I'd, I have all these recipes that my mom was teaching, that my dad was teaching, that mm -hmm. I've learned from people. I'm like this. I started looking it up and I couldn't find it. Like there's not a single blog about, um, about recipes that, yeah. world recipes for the grail. And I thought, you know, maybe there is a reason why there's not a single blog about it. Maybe people don't want that. But curiously, people started visiting the blog and started signing up for the newsletter and all that. And that was kind of like boosting, you know, me a little bit. And, and now this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm bringing all these recipes that I've learned from my trips here and there, all these things that I liked. And it's not only that. So some of them, you know, I'm going to restaurants here and there. I'm like discovering things here and there. And I'm adapting them for the grill and for barbecue lovers who are tired of the same recipes all the time <laughs> who want to escape a little bit. So that's how it came to be. <laughs> so that's how grill culture um, came about. No, let's give I love the way your story started. The way your story started is built on passion. Mm -hmm. It's built on an idea to fill a need, not only that you had, but that you've come to realize that a lot of people have. And because of that, it allowed your creative outlet. I mean, you can make money from what you're doing and you have the experience from other previous businesses, from traveling the world, mind you, 
from being mm-hmm. exposed to the industry. So you have an idea of what you're doing. Now I want to get to the more hands-on approach because it's, it's there. You've done that. But in terms of your experience with the overall venture, what has been your favorite part? Because I remember when you started, and this must have been, all right, so it's not going to be a defeat and blow when your wife said that, all right, from an English teacher's perspective, not so good of a blog post you have going on here. But I can (laughs) only imagine that it wasn't what you wanted to hear at the time. But here you are right now. So what would have been your top two or three experiences with it so far that you can share with us? You mean like successful things on the on the blog? It doesn't even have to be successful. It's just like things you've experienced. Maybe it's a dish you tried. Maybe it's just the ability to share your information with the world. Maybe it's just to sample different foods from different cultures. What is it that you've experienced with grill culture so far that has been your favorite thing to experience, really? Well, the the I think the thing that kept me going really has been Wagyu beef. Uh, so I was, it was, I, it was middle of pandemic and there was Mother's Day arriving, coming, and I had to come up with something special. I wanted to come up with something special for my wife. So I started looking things up. And uh, at that time, I, I had seen Wagyu beef uh, here and there. Um, wait, wait. Wagyu uh-huh. is W A G Y U? Wagyu? Yes, Wagyu. W A G Y U. It's pronounced Wagyu. Is Wagyu. That what it's Oh, Wagyu. Wagyu. Okay, okay. Wagyu, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's from Japan, technically, like from originally. That's like that mm-hmm. special but it's cattle from everywhere. Japan. Yeah, now it's kind of like everywhere. So, but um, yeah, so I, I found that Wagyu beef online and that was Snake River Farm. That was um, uh, the distributor that I work with because um, the, the Wagyu from Japan was important. It was super expensive, like completely unaffordable for me, especially at that time. Uh, so I kind of like kept on looking and I found Snake Roof Farm. I mean, they're a pioneer in Wagyu beef here in America. So I, I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to give it a shot. So I ordered my piece of, uh, of meat from them and he came home. It was like beautifully wrapped in a black box. It felt like, you know, I was a VIP on like, you know, some like special treat. <laughs> so, so I was very impressed by that. And then, uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a try. So I... And I re- I read about it because it was it was already a little expensive, so I was like, hey, you know what? I'm I'm not gonna mess up that recipe um, because for Mother's Day, not only that would be terrible to have a bad recipe, but if I give her the bill at the end and I tell her how much I spend on that, she's probably gonna hate me. Uh, so so I was like, okay, I I started researching and all that, so I, I came up with like a recipe that I was gonna try, and I tried, and we we were blown away both. Both she and I were like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And since then, like I, I was hooked. Like I could not get back to a normal piece of meat almost. It's like, I, how is it possible once you try that to get back to a normal cut of beef and just be like, Hey, you know, I, I like it. And, and it was like, and we just kept on, on ordering it. Um, and, um, and I just loved it so much that it became kind of like my kept, Keep on going. Like, hey, try and find new ways to cook these this amazing cut of beef. It was like your thing. Yeah, that became my thing. That became my, wow, I'm going to take that Wagyu beef to the next level. I'm going to take my grill to the next level in in a way that all of my friends are going to be like, hey, you know, that's the best thing I've ever tried. So anyway, so I kept on going. Um, but eventually at some point I was like, you know, I was I was very overwhelmed. Like there was like between the cooking, the making the videos, be, writing the blog, being a dad, being a husband, being a, mm-hmm. a good teacher. I was like, you know, I mean, how am I carved the time, you know, to write yeah. this post and all that. So, um, so the next revolution in my life was mm-hmm. Chad GPT. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I hired <laughs> Mr. Chad GPT to be my personal assistant, but, um, but I did not want Chad GPT to write my post, my post. I, I say it was like important for me that I write my recipe and so I, human I'm, touch and so on. exactly because I, I hate to post stuff on my blog that I haven't tried and perfected and that I don't really fully love. I've tried some recipe and they come out like disaster and I'm like, okay, not even if I wasted like a whole week working on it, I'm just not going to post it. So, so I just figured like, hey, I'm going to hire that chat GPT to do what my wife didn't want to do anymore, which was editing my work. 
So I would come up with my recipe and my template, and I would just like, create my recipe, try the ingredient, mix things up. And when I perfected my recipe, then I would give it to Mr. GPT and I would say, hey, can you put that together into like a coherent post and all that? And wow, that was like, this is exactly what I needed. Yeah, because I was like, hey, man, I was spending so much time. And then all of a sudden, it was like back to normal, like being able to have like a life with my wife and kids, but at the same time without compromising my post. So, um, so yeah, so these are the two revolutions that allowed me to keep on going with that. <laughs> I love your story. You know why I Thank love your you. story? This uh-huh. is something that is practical, right? And the reason mm-hmm. why I say practical is because it's something that each one of us, all of us can do in life at times. And I was just, I was on two previous um, interviews this morning. The one I had with Martin Schupen. Mm-hmm. And the other I had with, um, ooh, I don't remember his name right. I'm not going to puzzle my brain because I'm running on like three hours of sleep. But <laughs> the thing that came out in both of these interviews this morning mm-hmm. is that at times we get so caught up in what we think is, is Zachary, O-L, Zachary O-E-H-L-M-E-R. That's the other person's name. A lot of times we get caught up in the glitz and the glam and we get caught up in what's not normal, thinking that it's normal because of social. But we fail to remember that we ourselves are unique human beings with very distinct talents and experiences that we need to share with the world. But because, okay, so let's say for you it's wacky. You, right? you could say it's wacky, but because your wacky recipe is not out there, you could have said to yourself, you know what, there is not a place for me out there. If there was a place, somebody would be doing it. And you would have never get started. But you said, you know what? I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm experiencing. I would like to share it with the world. And you got up, you got out, and you got it done. Sharing it with the world for the past, let's say, four years. Because believe it or not, it's actually 2024 coming up right now. So let's say it's about mm-hmm. four years you've been sharing that with the world. It's gone on wonderfully. I love that because anybody can do it. Your experiences alone set you apart. And hats off to you, man. You've done <laughs> what a lot of us should do. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a Silicon Valley unicorn in white that wears um, glass heels and mm-hmm. sings about Cinderella with a golden harp. However, however weird that scenario is, you know, it doesn't have to be a unique business like that. It just has to be something that comes from the heart. And even in the creative space, as I'm sure you would have realized is, when you speak from the heart, which is why I believe you don't want ChatGPT to write your blog posts for you. When you speak from mm-hmm. the heart and from experience and from a place of passion that resonates with your audience. Here's where I'm going to have to, it's not going to be putting you on the spot, but I'm going to be asking you a question that's perhaps one of the most important questions I could ask this evening. Or well, at this time, because I don't know where people are listening from. Mm-hmm. We see someone right here. You're a teacher. I haven't even got to touch on a teacher perspective. You've traveled the world. You've experienced different cuisines. You're a husband. You're a father. You're an amazing person. I can guess as well that you're an amazing friend and Thank you. son <laughs> and so on. You're just such a joy to be around. What are we doing wrong? And this is perhaps going to be a difficult question. What are we doing wrong? Why so many times we get caught up on the smaller things in life. I need a faster car. I need a bigger house. I need to make more money. When we are where we are, I wouldn't say that you've settled and you haven't pushed yourself, but I would say that you're very happy and comfortable with where you are. So how can we be more like that in lieu of everything, despite everything that's there distracting us to say that there's so much more that we could be? And really off a fact, that's not what we really need. We just need to be comfortable in our own skins. If you get what I'm asking, you know, how to be happy in life. And I think this might come back to fate, but I want to leave that to you to decide. (laughs) <laughs> that's a big decision i i don't know you know honestly i don't have the answer to that question i feel like we're all different you know finding happiness in life comes in different form and everything to me i, I just feel like like i said so always get back to like that place of like making peace with who you are and what you have <clears throat> and that's how you you find it to me i mean honestly my kids my wife and kids have been my they, they were my everything i mean i had wonderful parents um they were always there for me and, and all that. But I felt like every day I wake up and I look at them and I'm like, my gosh, this is like 
I'm blessed. This is wh- whatever happens, as long as they're around, I'm, I'm just, this is all I want. This is when I see them smiling and laugh and all that, this is where I'm like, okay, whatever I do is very secondary. Like, it doesn't matter if I have like a fancy car, doesn't matter if, you know, we have a bigger house, doesn't matter if whatever I'm, as long as they're part of it, everything is going to be fine, no matter where we are. So this is my happiness. This is my place to go where I'm like, I have a doubt. I have moments where I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, I mean, my neighbor got the new car and it's like pretty fancy. So it's like, I, just, I felt like, Hey, maybe I can get one. Like, <laughs> so. Wow. And that's, um, as men, that's something that does appeal to us really. Yeah. yeah do but my, don't worry. My wife, my wife is like, no, don't even think about it. <laughs> but you know, that that's, in and of itself, relaxing. Yeah. I think if you can control your desires, you're halfway on the way to happiness. Mm-hmm. It's good to have things, but if you have everything that you ever want, then even then you're not going to be happy because getting things, it's only going to add so much happiness after a certain point, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I took a, um, I took a for me, like it's, it's kind of like a training that I took when I was in the textile business. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, it was um, a lean management training, and um, it was probably like an, an amazing. I, I mean, it really changed my mind frame uh, around everything. And it, that, the idea is that continuous cycle of improvement. You basically you you are you 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 set your goals like so whatever this is what I want to have or this is what I want to do, and you you do it with work and you do it with whatever you you want, but you can do it also at a personal level, and then you have to kind of like write things down. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, I want to lose whatever, 20 pounds. I'm going to, this is my goal. I'm going to set my goal everywhere. I'm going to get everybody on board with that. I'm going to have a plan of action and then I'm going to measure it. I, I'm going to continuously see what is wrong. So you write down, okay, today, this is what I have. Oh man, this is, I'm having too much sweet here. Oh, I'm having too much that there. And you just continue working on that. And I feel like this is something that has really helped me. Mm-hmm. Like how much time I want to spend with my wife, how much time I want to spend with my kids, how much time I need to spend for work, so how much time I see for the blog. And I continuously work on that. And I, I think as long as you keep the destination, the journey of like how you get there, and it, it, it should always be a constant, constant level of improvement. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that might be a way, of, like a technique, you know, for everyone out there to just you know, get on that path things. to finding the happiness that you're looking for. And something that you said that I also know helps is you said that when you look at your kids, and I'm sure you look at your wife as well, when you look mm-hmm. at your family, let's put it that way, family man, when you look at your family, you say, you know what, it doesn't matter what, I'll be able to make it through. And the reason why I bring this up is because when I was speaking to Martin earlier, he's going to be in the episode before this one airs, mm-hmm. he said that... Having a noise, actually Zach. So Zach, then Martin, then yourself. When I spoke with Zach, he said that whenever you focus on helping others and doing good for others, that act in and of itself also helps you to be happy. And Mm -hmm. I also realized that because they are your family, they are your own flesh and blood. By doing good to them, I'm not a father, not yet, I will be. When you do good for them, in a way, it's like you're rewarding yourself. Because you love them so much. So, I mean, that in and of itself is also very beautiful. And I'm happy I could, I'm happy I could sit down and talk to you, you know, just to learn about your dreams, your passions, your hobbies, who you are as a person. I mean, you are doing what I believe a lot of us really should do. And the reason why I say that is because I'm going to allude back to what I said earlier. A lot of times we get caught up in the glitz and glam of an extraordinary life when that's not what's going to bring us happiness. To quote Zachary yet again, you can see I'm very fond of Zachary, can't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zachary said that he lived the life, right? He got the, go- he got the job. He, he was making the money. He was getting the car, the house, and uh-huh. everything. He had it all, and then he realized that it wasn't what he wanted. And he changed up, and he started doing things for others. And he's such a cheery guy right now. Traveled the world like yourself. There's something uh-huh. about traveling with people that are happy that I'm starting to realize here. And hats off. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, life is a, life should be a beautiful journey. It shouldn't mm-hmm. be about, you know, stress. And it's always like, you know, it's kind of like that whole, you know, there is what you want and there is what you need. 
And sometimes you don't really see what you need. You, you think what you need is what you want, but that's not. <laughs> yes, that's true. I am. Um, well, it's been, uh, it's been great being here and great to yeah. booster. <laughs> I like the compliments. <laughs> you know, one question before we leave. One, 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 yes. one question. Yes. Real culture. Do you like uh -huh. go to shows and, um, parks or, um, are any events where listeners, viewers could actually taste your cooking of the recipes that you have? I, I do not go to any trade shows or any contest. Um, uh, it's what? just because I, I don't know. I just feel like they're usually very like traditional within that whole, like, Hey, mm -hmm. let's make brisket. Let's make ribs. Uh, and I'm kind of like, you know, I think there's enough out there. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, the best way to just experience my cooking, I think is just through the, the, the videos. Yes, so I'm like posting videos once a week and, um, it's just like, as long as you follow it, uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to get I, I I'm testing them and then I have someone test them to make sure that the steps that I have, they're good. So it's a teacher in me. Like I got my lesson plans and all that. <laughs> so I'm going to share them. My brother yeah. is a chef, you know, and his fiance is also a chef. So oh, but you can ask him to try share. and give me some input. <laughs> oh yeah. Can I tell you? Um, how did you enjoy your time today on the Boardroom Podcast? It was great. It was great. Thank you very much for having me. It was fun. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, well, yeah, it was very refreshing. Good, I loved it. Good. <laughs> we have a tradition on the podcast where whenever uh -huh. so, a guest is on, they've had a good time. We like to ask them the all important question. Given your time on the Boardroom Podcast, who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask them? And have them answer for you. I guess. Well, I mean, you talk so much about your guest. Uh, I, I guess I would like to watch that episode, to listen to that episode, see uh, see about his journey. <laughs> Are you like to learn about Zachary's journey? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. It's and it's a big change, you know. I mean, I I feel like this is still like you know the idea of success, um, mm -hmm. and and through all that material stuff, it, it's kind of like a big thing when you go from you know having it all to. Mm -hmm to deciding that you're going to make, like I have like a 360 like twist around it and, and just kind of like go into a different field. I would really much like to hear about that. <laughs> I got good news for you. Yes. Before your episode goes live, Zachary's uh -huh. episode is going to go live. He's an entrepreneur. He helps entrepreneurs. He's a consultant and everything. And we barely touched on business. We talked a lot about life and happiness and success and your your question is going to be answered. Let's put it that way. Ah, <laughs> good. <laughs> good. So thank you for an awesome time, Thierry. This has been wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>